A Song of Ice and Fire is flush with fantastic chapters. You can make an argument for several, if not many, chapters in any given book being the best of that specific book, of the series, or even in fiction, at least in my eyes. Uh, there are fantastic ones throughout the series. There's Ned's death in the first book. There's Danny Five, A Clash of Kings, which contains the House of the Undying. There's Catelyn Seven, A Storm of Swords, which is famously the Red Wedding. There's The Drowned Man, containing the King's Moot in uh, Feast for Crows, which I do hold is probably the worst adapted show uh, only seen as it was very bad in the show. And for my money, the best chapter in the entire series comes from A Dance with Dragons. It's not as iconic as The Red Wedding, The Purple Wedding, Ned's Death, anything like that. But for me, it delivers a very concise thematic experience and offers an in-depth look at a character that is fairly new to us and provides so much information and pathos for him in such a short amount of time. Today, I'll be discussing that chapter. Today, I'll discuss my favorite chapter, The Griffin Reborn. For those who are more familiar with the channel, you are probably not surprised by my pick. My love for John Connington is absolutely no secret. He's my favorite character in the series, and I think that his second chapter and uh, final chapter so far is the best in the series. For those who might not be as familiar with the books, John Connington is a character who first appears in A Dance with Dragons. He had a very important role in Robert's Rebellion, where he briefly served as Hand of the King, and overall was trying to win the war for... Uh, Ares II, and more specifically for Rhaegar Targaryen, who he was in love with. He went and fought Robert Baratheon at the Battle of the Bells, and following the loss of that battle, goes overseas to Essos in order to join the Golden Company and uh, essentially drink himself into an early grave. However, we find out in Dance, he is not in his grave. He is advancing the claim of a supposed heir to the Iron Throne, Aegon Targaryen, the son of his lost love, Rhaegar. His first chapter, The Lost Lord, serves as an introduction to the Golden Company and the soldiers behind Aegon's cause. It essentially allows Aegon to turn this entire campaign around, as they were originally marching to Daenerys, but now they are marching west instead of east, going to Westeros ahead of the Dragon Queen to hopefully claim the throne before she even has a chance to. After this chapter, we get a decent break from Jon Connington's point of view, but towards the very end of Dance, we get The Griffin Reborn. In my eyes, this chapter sort of has three dimensions to it. The present frames events both in the past and in the future, and all three of these create a very kind of a multi-layered experience for the reader where you're going through Connington's emotions and memories while still focusing on the future and what might be next for both the Golden Company, Aegon, and Westeros as a whole. The main driving event of this chapter is the capture of Griffin's Roost, John Connington's old castle from before he was exiled. He states that he is using archers to do so, and this very much shows a bit of a change, so he thinks, in his character. He used to not like archers, and now he's using them because he thinks they're more strategic. He also very uh, notably remarks that he thought he was going to lose over a hundred men in taking this castle, while they only lost four. I believe this to be an overall indication of how the Golden Company's campaign on Westeros might be. Expecting a lot of resistance, given that's what happens when you invade a continent, it really seems like there's not going to be that much of a fight put up by those on Westeros in order to kind of allow Aegon to come to the throne. Then suddenly, in an instant after this castle is captured, John Connington is once more a lord. He dons the colors of his house, he washes out the colors from his hair, and he reclaims his rightful seat. Uh, he talks to some of his family members, who he's captured as well, and there's a bit of a funny exchange uh, where he talks about wanting to get to know his family a bit more until the bastard son of the lord of the castle says that his father is going to kill him, where he very much changes his mind on an instant and just leaves the cells. Even though Connington has returned home, he notes that he feels odd. Those around this castle are viewing him with strangers' eyes, as they really haven't seen him or been privy to any of his life, as he's lived the past 20 years, most of these people's lives, away from the castle, in exile. After this taking of the castle and taking his family members prisoner, Connington departs the Golden Company to supposedly go to the Sept and pray for his late father. Instead of going down the stairs, he goes up to the roof, where instead of praying for his father, he prays for his lost love. Thinking of Rhaegar, John Connington reflects both on visitations that the prince had had to his land in his youth, in addition to giving us the full perspective on the Battle of the Bells, what his thought processes were, and exactly what was going on at that point in his life. John Connington's thoughts on this rooftop are notably tinged with regret. There isn't really a single thought he has that isn't colored by this emotion. Even in thinking of his happy memories with Rhaegar looking out across these lands on this roof, he regrets saying that this land will all one day be his. He feels as though it's kind of bragging to somebody who really is going to have a lot more land than that, as he's going to be the king of 
all of Westeros. It is kind of funny as well that Rhaegar is essentially talking about lands and just kind of making small talk while Jon Connington is having these deep kind of revelatory love uh, conversations with himself in his head, just out of his kind of obsession with Rhaegar at that point. It's a nice little bit of levity in what is a fairly uh, fairly melodramatic or uh, generally a downer sequence. It's at this point where we learn why the Battle of the Bells was lost. At this point in his rebellion, Robert was on the back foot. He had just lost the only battle he would ever lose and was hiding alone in this small town, Stony Sept, where Connington was tearing the town apart in order to look for him. Unfortunately, Robert was hidden by the townspeople as they loved him, and Connington was not willing to burn the town down, as he says Tywin would have done. He wanted the honor and the glory of defeating Robert Baratheon in single combat and winning this war for Rhaegar. He specifically thinks that he would, these days, end up burning the town down rather than have any lingering element of Robert's Rebellion survive as he kind of takes this lesson from Tywin and seems to internalize it for at least his campaign going forward with Aegon, which we might say play out at a later point in the conflict. It is on this rooftop where his thoughts deliver two of my favorite quotes in the series. The first is simple, I failed the father, I will not fail the son. It's just so to the point and just serves as a perfect distillation of the entirety of his character, which I'll get to a little later in thematic analysis. The other is a bit more complex and has a bit more kind of poetry to it, which I quite like in the terms of John Connington's character as a whole. Quote, I rose too high, loved too hard, dared too much. I tried to grasp a star, overreached, and fell. After dropping those two banger quotes, he goes downstairs and has sort of a mini small council meeting that I quite like with Halden Halfmaester. Specifically, they discuss the kind of prospects of alliances they have in Westeros. Halden floats the Vale as an idea, as they really haven't been touched by rebellion so far, but Connington focuses on Dorne, as they're a lot closer and would have direct ties to Aegon through Rhaegar's marriage to Elia, who would be... Uh, Aegon's mother. Albeit, Jon really doesn't like Elia and has some pretty negative thoughts about her in this chapter. He's a little jealous, but who who couldn't blame him for that? Uh, overall, the thought is to bring the Dornish into this alliance and hopefully just have them do it for free, pretty much. Jon Connington really doesn't want to offer Aegon's hand in marriage so he can marry Daenerys. And when Halden uh, suggests that Connington marry Arion, which personally, uh, two of my favorite point of view characters, I don't think they'd be good together, mostly because he's gay, but Overall, it'd be fun to see them interact, uh, but he just kind of stares at Halden and doesn't say yes to that. So instead, they send a letter off to the Dornish just pleading for aid and saying that we can offer you revenge and we have your uh, nephew, that would be, yeah, Duran's nephew, if I'm thinking of family trees correctly, come help him. At the end of this meeting, John Connington returns to his room and we get an update on the ending of his last chapter. His grayscale is spread and it now has four of his fingernails infected as well as one of his fingers all the way up to the second knuckle. This is a major driving force for the character as well and further serves to enforce kind of this melting pot of motivations that they're establishing for Connington in this chapter. As the first chapter he had was very much more kind of functional than anything else. It was just kind of designed to be a view into the Aegon camp and figure out exactly how they decide to go uh, west instead of east. This allows us to see John Connington's full kind of scale of motivations. And additionally, taking this castle and being back at his home once again seems to be a major change for John Connington. The name of this chapter is The Griffin Reborn, and it's in this chapter that he seems to reclaim his name. In the later books in the series, Martin tends to like to have characters come into their own and use chapter titles that are their own names rather than a title once they've sort of rediscovered or discovered themselves for the first time. I would imagine that any chapters that John Connington is going to have in The Winds of Winter will probably start with his name just being John, especially given the death of the other John in our story. This chapter ends on a cliffhanger, albeit that might just be because it's been 12 years and it hasn't been followed up on, and it just seems like a cliffhanger given time, but regardless, Aegon Targaryen arrives at Griffin's Roost, and the Golden Company moves on Storm's End, finally, or at least plans to move on Storm's End. It is a massive development, as the Sellsword Company from the East is going to try to claim one of the largest castles in Westeros. It also serves as a bit of insight into the relationship between Aegon and John Connington. We see that Aegon is a bit impulsive, a bit like a younger John Connington, as he is wanting to rush into this battle and lead it himself for the sake of honor and glory. It's in this moment that John Connington compares Aegon to his supposed father, and there's a hint of doubt that I didn't notice until I reread this chapter for this video. Specifically, he remembers uh, when Aegon says, Lord Connington, I like your castle. He remembers uh, Rhaegar saying that your father's lands are beautiful. 
He also specifically notes that Rhaegar's eyes were dark purple, darker than this boy's. I don't know, something about the phrase this boy's in this context makes me think that John Connington might have at least some unconscious seed that maybe this isn't Aegon Targaryen. Maybe this isn't my best friend slash love's son. Maybe this is all a fraud. But overall, I don't think that's something that John Connington consciously knows or will ever consciously realize, at least without a complete breakdown. Now that we've got the actual contents of the chapter covered, we're going to get on to what is my favorite part of this chapter and of this video being the thematic analysis of what actually is going on here in terms of the ideas and the story that Martin is trying to communicate. I think it's pretty dense and it takes a couple readings to really figure out where it's going, but I think I, I've, I've really enjoyed what I've gotten out of this chapter and I'll explain it now. The Griffin Reborn spends much of its page length presenting its thesis, which I believe is applicable to both Connington and to the narrative at large. It's a chapter about the past, the present, and the future. It's a chapter about cycles and routines and habits that people enter without even knowing they've entered them. John Connington reflects on his memories and his regrets, thinking himself a better man, or at least a wiser one. He's learned from his mistakes at the Battle of the Bells, and he won't repeat them again. But he will. John Connington views his mistake as searching tirelessly for Robert Baratheon, only being sated by the idea of besting this rebel in single combat. That is a mistake, but it's not the root of the issue. John Connington's mistake was devoting himself entirely to a Targaryen prince, and working tirelessly until the goals of that prince were achieved. John Connington was fully living for another person, framing his life only in the context of the individual who he loved, deriving his value for himself and for his life solely from the desperate hope that one day that love would be reciprocated in full. Connington's mistake did not fade, but rather it bears repeating. John Connington, treading the same literal ground he once did with Rhaegar, does the same with Rhaegar's supposed son. His mistake lingers as his devotion has changed from romantic love to that of a father, but it's also grown in intensity. Connington is prepared to unleash terror on Westeros on a level far beyond the Battle of the Bells, just to appease the ghost of a man who could have loved him but didn't. The Griffin Reborn presents the reader with the idea that people don't really change. They think they do. Their circumstances change. Those around them change. Their knowledge changes. They may even think themselves changed, but in reality, the core of an individual remains the same. The illusions within us and surrounding us change, but there's an immutable center to every being. We walk forward in circles, seeing new surroundings, yet not realizing we're repeating the same patterns over and over until our feet give out beneath us. The Griffin Reborn is my favorite chapter in A Song of Ice and Fire, and I think it's best read as a cautionary tale. It warns that the road to hell is paved with good intentions, and that devoting oneself entirely to a cause or a person can have disastrous consequences if the self and the situation at large is not considered. Hey, that got heavy for a minute, but I have channel updates, so this will be a little lighter. I just wanted to give people a little bit of context on what's going to happen going forward on the channel. My next video is probably going to be about uh, the characters cut from Game of Thrones that are in A Song of Ice and Fire. That was supposed to be the video for today, but I ended up getting sidetracked with this video and the fact that I've gotten a million fantastic suggestions of who to include in that video. Additionally, I'm working on another retrospective, similarly to my A Dance with Dragons retrospective, but this one's on Clash for its 25th anniversary in a few weeks, so look forward to that. Additionally, last announcement, and biggest announcement, I am working on a brand new show for this channel. My goal is to bring in people from all over the Song of Ice and Fire and Game of Thrones community for conversations about the work and about their relation to it, kind of in the framing of this specific video. My initial idea was to ask people their favorite or least favorite chapter and why it stands out to them. I do have uh, plans for putting this out pretty soon here. It is in the early stages of development, but I wanted to mention it because this video is very much inspired by it. Thank you all so much for watching. This has been a really fun video to make. I think the analysis here is some of my favorite I've ever done, and I will take any excuse I can get to talk about John Con because he's the best character. Uh, if you enjoyed, be sure to leave a like and subscribe. I really appreciate it. Uh, press the bell icon to give John Connington a panic attack based on the Battle of the Bells. Uh, and yeah, I really appreciate any support. Leave a comment. What's your favorite chapter? I'd love to hear as well. Uh, I really appreciate all of you watching, and I will see you in the very near future with all of those things I listed earlier. Thank you again. Goodbye.